<laughs> yes. I'll try one. I'll try one of these. I'm not used to using microphone, as you can probably tell. Um, so hey, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm uh, working for Blockstream, and one of my pet projects, as of uh, a year and a half ago, probably, is uh, what's called Greenlight. Uh, it used to be an internal code name only. I'm not allowed to choose names anymore ever since the L2 fiasco. <laughs> so um, if, if, if the name is too simple and too sort of pedantic, uh, that's why. Um, the idea was born out of the question, hey, um, is there a way for us to enable lightning in green? So the name is also aspirational. Uh, uh, it turns out uh, we do have a couple of integrations. Um, uh, one, of, uh, one of them is going to be green, but it's not going to, uh, to be the first one. So congrats to Breeze on that. Um, and Breeze will, of course, have the next work, uh, workshop, and they will tell you exactly how they add additional features on top of Greenland. Um, so as you can see, uh, the unofficial motto, or one of them, is keep your keys, we do the rest, right? The idea is uh, that uh, we are an infrastructure provider, uh, which you don't have to trust. Uh, we take on some of the responsibility for you, and you can get on your journey uh, to learn about Bitcoin, to learn about Lightning, to safely operate a node. And once you're retired, you will actually have time to do all that. Um, until then, we will do it for you. OK. So um, this is a quote that I can't attribute, uh, but uh, I think every single Lightning operator has felt this before. Uh, running a Lightning node is bloody hard. Um, not only do you have to know about Bitcoin, uh, the internals of Bitcoin, uh, how, how it works from the outside, but now we're all adding a new layer, and that's not just uh, not just an abstraction layer. It's also a technical layer that brings with it its own nomenclature, its own terminology, its own uh, its own pitfalls, and of course its own misunderstandings and issues that we might run into. Um, oh, and an economist too, if you don't want to end up on the street without any money anymore. Uh, because in Lightning, a technical issue is a financial issue. There is no way around that. The way we secure the Lightning network uh, from, uh, from untrusted parties committing nefarious, uh, nefarious actions is by punishing them. Sadly, you can also end up with one of these punishable actions out of restoring a backup, for example. So um, there's a lot to learn. Um, I'll answer later, okay? Um, so when we have a new user that wants to join the, uh, the network, they are presented with quite the conundrum. As, uh, as Bitcoiners, I'm guessing we probably want them to go for a node, non-custodial, self-hosted, and then there is a bit of a trade-off if we want to bundle the node with the applications that we actually intend to run, or whether we want to have the applications reach out to a central node that is sort of aggregates all of our funds and serves as a single point of contact to the Lightning Network for you as a user. Uh, however, we see that many people go that way. And uh, that's too bad but I don't think the users are to blame in this case. Uh, it's us as developers who should make it more accessible, who should be able to uh, abstract these issues away, and we should make it more palpable to actually go down this road, right? Uh, so at least to the self-hosted part. So we were presented uh, with this, let me just quickly skip ahead. Yeah, okay, so that's the solution. Making slides at midnight the day before the presentation, bad idea. <laughs> anyway, um, so why is that? Uh, when a user joins the network, they get presented with this 1,000 page tome. And we as a community, we shame them into, oh, you have to do it right, or you don't get to do it at all, right? And well, the lucky survivors of that attitude are here, I guess. Um, 
But guess how many more people we could be if we were a bit more approachable, I guess? And I think that the incentives in all of this, uh, the systems are upside down, right? We don't, we should not be telling people you read this first and then you get to, uh, to, to uh, see how well it works and how much it uh, makes your life easier. Uh, most people will sort of get to page 10 and then throw the book into the bin. Nobody will complete that unless you're a techie and that stuff is actually interesting to you. Um, I should probably turn off Telegram, but just ignore that. Um, so um, I think we should give users a taste of what Lightning and Bitcoin can do, incentivize them, show them the positive sides of being a Bitcoiner, and then we can hit them with a thousand page tone. Then they won't expect it. But they probably would be more interested than if, if we didn't show them the upside first, right? So, okay, we'll turn that off. Uh, where did I check? Oh, oh, oh. That should have been it, okay. Um, so this strategy I call onboard, educate, offboard for Greenlight. Our goal is to provide an easy, secure setup from the get-go that you as a newly onboarded user, not, not you here in the room, I know you all are more than capable of running Lightning Nodes, talking about your users, the ones that are uh, going to have to learn about all of this. Um, you can, uh, you can onboard them easily, give them a secure option, and now they are incentivized to educate themselves. And my goal in, in all of this is once we have fully realized Bitcoiners, informed Bitcoiners, now it's time for them to take on responsibility for their own nodes and take, uh, take it onto their own infrastructure, right? Okay, all of this about sort of the taxonomy of, of how we, where we can deploy nodes, how to onboard people and where people end up. Uh, we, so I want to compete with this branch of, of the tree and hopefully get people into this branch of the tree. I did not turn that off, did I? Okay. <laughs> Anywho, it's small enough that you can't read it and it's, that's an alert of stuff going down. So don't worry, <laughs> I'm not on call. Anyway, uh, why, is it, why is running a Lightning Node hard, right? There's many pieces to, to the puzzle. Uh, there's the node itself, right? What do you choose? CLN, LND, Eclair, LDK, Ptarmigan, if it's still around, I don't know. Um, then you somehow have to attach it to the Bitcoin network, where you have to have a way to communicate to the, uh, to the Bitcoin network. For most people uh, in this room, it's probably Bitcoin D. Uh, for others, it might be an explorer. Uh, for others still, it might be an Electrum server. Uh, there's uh, the database. If you, ever run, uh, if you ever run a writing node, that will be painful. Um, the database not only has to be, uh, be performant, but it also has to uh, has to support uh, point in time snapshots uh, because, like I said before, if you restore an old backup, you are actually losing money. Um, that is, unless your counterparty is is nice and closes on your behalf, which goes a bit against sort of the complexity that we added uh, to to make stuff secure. If we then just ask our counterparty, "Hey, sorry, I lost something. Can I get it back?" Um, back, uh, backups are dangerous watchtowers. Uh, what happens if we're offline, right? So, so we need something to, to secure uh, our node. Topology management, routing information, collecting routing information. How many of you have tried looking up your own node on a, uh, on a, on a node explorer and haven't found it? Uh, it takes time for, for information to propagate in this network. And it does so on purpose, by the way, because I'm the one that introduced the staggered broadcast. 
to purposefully sabotage quick updates that uh, some people might be tempted to do. Why? Because it's a privacy leak. Uh, so much more. But the point that, that I'm trying to get here uh, is that many of these can actually be run very efficiently if we, uh, if we uh, sort of, uh, uh, instead of doing it per node, we have a trusted system. Yes, it's trusted. That, act, uh, that, that does that on your behalf and then feeds you a summary of, uh, of this kind of information. For example, we only have one Bitcoin being in the entirety of the system. And we have thousands of nodes running against that. So we spend the, this space once instead of a couple of thousand. Um, yeah. So how does splitting a node work, right? Uh, the idea here is that we have our lightning node. Uh, this is core lightning. Uh, from the very get-go, we had an architecture that involved these Multi, multiple demons. So there's Gossip D, there's Lightning D, which is sort of the main demon. And we have the HSMD, which is the sole part that actually ever touches keys. And then we have plugins that, that you can write in whatever language and you can directly interact with, uh, with the Lightning uh, node as such. And we expose a JSON RPC as well. And then you'd have the clients that actually talk to the JSON RPC and sort of interact with it. Um, now, if we want to host user nodes, but not be in control of funds, we have to split this up, right? We can't have the signer be on the same machine that is under the control of the node operator, when in reality, it's some other user who is the owner of those funds, right? I, as a node operator, should not be able to move any funds without the user's permission, right? That's that's something that I want for my own safety because I mean, having access to user uh, funds is a big liability. So how do we separate this? So uh, we, uh, we do so by essentially just rewiring a couple of steps. Um, so imagine we have, we have a separation in here this all runs on uh, on our servers, and this uh, this runs on the client. So you can already see that on the client side, we now have the signer itself. This is the only component that ever has access to the private keys, and as such, the private keys are located with a user. The signer is part of a library called GL Client, which uh, implements a gRPC interface. Uh, that can talk to a deal plugin. This deal plugin essentially just re-exposes the JSON RPC as gRPC and you can just talk to it. It's nothing huge. The, uh, the interesting part is that we've actually switched out the signer on the server side with a proxy that just sends incoming requests over to the plugin, which ships it over to the deal client, which ships it over to the HSMD, and then goes back. So if anything requires a signature in this entire system, which happens whenever you touch funds or open a connection, funnily enough, um, the Lightning D will issue a signature request to the signer proxy, which will then go on this round trip here and deliver it back here, right? We never had access to, so to private keys. Uh, you as user independently verified that what, whatever we sent you made sense for, uh, for the current state and based on, uh, on what you know about the user's intent. If you want, I can dive in more into that, but for now, user's intent. Uh, we can verify that it actually came from a user, caused some changes, went through back here uh, and <laughs> Basically, connect then returns to the client here. Um, yeah, sure. Maybe it's a bit technical, but um, there are cases where a channel need to be updated, mm -hmm. and it's not the client that will request it. Maybe like when fees increase uh, in the mempool, they need to resign with a higher fee. 
Mm -hmm. And like it, the demand will not come from the client, it will come from the network typically. So how is this being managed? Uh, pretty much the same. I mean, uh, all we did is actually move the HSMD over here. Uh, so if something is triggered internally without coming from the outside, it will still go through and make it make this way around to uh, to be answered. So independently of who initiated a change, uh, the HSMD has sort of enough information to know, oh, this, this is something that was triggered from the network. I can just sign it. But the, the app need to be online somehow. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I can tell more about that uh, later. Um, but that's that's a very good point. Uh, we can't do any progress while the signer isn't present, right? So if the if the user isn't present, this link here is essentially broken, uh, which means that the Lightning node on here can't make progress. So we shut it down. And if you're back and need your node again, we will shut it up in less than 100 milliseconds. So what uh, this, this uh, essentially makes sure that we don't get into a situation where we need to sign off something but don't have the signer attached. And on the other <coughs> hand, it saves us massive resources. The downside, of course, is that we now have to work around stuff like invoices coming in or stuff like that. And we have to work around Oh yeah, that's that's definitely something that is implemented. So when when the lightning node is is offline or we woke it up and it actually needs to sign something, we uh, we plan to have webhooks that actually talk to app developers who probably know best how to wake up their own yeah. application, right? So for us, it's uh, it's essentially oh, there's something that requires interaction. We'll notify some registered webhooks, and hopefully somebody will will, will come by and sign and sign off on it. It's interesting to see though that um, I'll talk about more uh, this more later. Is that you can uh, attach as many clients as you want, and as many signers as you want, and as long as one is online, you're good to make progress. Uh, so I personally think we will probably see a a multitude of uh, applications that are use case specific, right? Have a wallet, have a stacking app that controls how much you stack per month. I have a chat app that like Sphinx, uh, which is one of our early uh, uh, early test partners. Um, and they in combination each have a signer. So as long as one of them is reachable, we can make progress. Yes. Have you considered a man in the middle attack here and how do you prevent it? Uh, where would your man in the middle is? There is many connections. And so is it the connection of doing the sign, right? To, uh, to connect this one? between the TO plugin and the TO client. Yeah. I, I could jump in and make a request and then send it over and pretend I'm the Lightning D. Uh, so, so you don't have to pretend to be Lightning D. Lightning D is completely untrusted in all of this. Um, the point is man in the middle. I, I, could, I could say, here, please sign this. Yeah, I want to perform that and say, okay, perfect, fine. And then I'm taking a signature, forwarding it to, and then say, I'm, I'm this one. Yeah. And I'm simply exchanged. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, th that, that comes down to what, me what it means to have user's intent. And I, uh, good point. Thanks for following up on that. Uh, what we have is essentially each of these is has a TLS certificate. So, Forget about TLS, it's a private public key pair. They have an identity that only these GL clients have. Each one has their own. Um, what we do is then we take a gRPC payload, which is a protobuf serialized, uh, we sign that payload, okay? Um, we then send it over to the GL plugin, the GL plugin, adds it as a context to the signature request that we are going to sign. And, and upon seeing the signature request coming in here, we associate the context with the signature request. So what we have is we have proof that this client originated the RPC call. Uh, and 
um, and the signature request is checked against that request, right? So we have this, this closure of, of, the, of the circle where it all ends up at the GL client again. And before passing it on to the signer, the signer itself doesn't do much verification. The, uh, the client itself uh, uh, says, okay, it's wanting me to sign off on a transaction. This transaction is a commitment transaction. Do I have something which may cause such a, such a request to be triggered? Oh, I'm adding an HTLC, perfect. Let's check. Do we, do we also have a request for an HTLC for that payment hash? Indeed, do the, uh, do the amounts match? And so on and so forth. So you can you basically reconcile the user's intent expressed as signed gRPC payloads with the effects that uh, that we are being asked to sign off. Let's take your example. So let's let's make it easy. Uh, I'm I'm an attacker who basically took over control of of the hosting infrastructure. Right. Um, the JSON RPC is still present. I can still talk to it. Right. So for example, I could say, hey, uh, how about you drain the entirety of the funds to this nice looking address, which happens to be mine. That does not create an entry here. And because it can't, it can't create a signature from this client to authorize that, that RPC command. Um, so we go through the motions, Lightning decomputes the state changes, sends the request over to the signer proxy, which pipes it through this entire chain. But here we will see, hey, we're being asked to sign off a withdrawal. I don't see a withdrawal request. Go away. So the entire, uh, the, the entire control over funds is always inside of these, uh, these two components, the GL client and the sign. And that is exactly why I feel comfortable even, uh, even managing user, even well, managing user funds uh, as, in, uh, as in I can't touch them, right? Without this, I definitely wouldn't feel safe. So within the security model, the, the, the Lightning node cannot really propose the client to automatically create the channel where it's going, right? Exactly, yeah unless uh, we create a policy inside of this verification that says, I know it's touching mm -hmm. funds, but I'm okay with being helped by somebody. Uh, but much more likely it would be that uh, we, can actually, we can actually constrain the access, uh, the access that this connection has uh, using these identities, right? We just simply give these identities each a uh, role that they have, and they can only execute commands they have in their in that role. If we wanted to assist our users with opening channels, we'd ask them to give us a uh, certificate that gives us exactly that amount of of, of options. Uh, so we probably wouldn't try to sort of go go around the verification, but become actual. Um, uh, permissioned and authorized users of the node itself for that specific aspect. One more question there. Yeah, just wondering about uh, performance. How much is this the proxy, or is it affecting some like any latency because of the proxy or any? Um, yes. Uh, so this proxy here adds a couple of microseconds. Uh, this plugin here, which does the JSON RPC translation and the uh, and the signature context uh, thingy, is around one millisecond. Uh, this connection here is about one hundred and fifty milliseconds. So, yes, your your signatures are delayed. That's for sure, uh, because a signature has to make this whole round trip. But the dominating part is once we leave our own host, right? And everything else happens just to be on the same host. Any more questions? Perfect. So um, what are the benefits for the user? Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is uh, the um, users for us are pretty much just a key pair. Uh, we don't, we don't have any other information for you. 
So how do you register and how do you recover your node more importantly? Well, you have your C. Uh, when you register, we send you a challenge, you sign it, send it back, and we can verify you have access to the C, so we can give you a certificate that has access to that node. The same goes for recovery. Uh, if I go sailing again, uh, which I'm known to do from time to time, um, and have a boating accident, which I do from time to time, um, then I might have a slip of paper somewhere hidden at home with, with my sea freight. And all I have to do is to prove to Greenlight essentially that yes, you are the owner of that node and it will give you access. Right? So it's not, you don't have to worry about uh, databases and backups and keeping it up to date or anything like that. We do that. Um, unlike, uh, unlike, the, yeah, sorry. Can uh, Greenlight use uh, that? Can Greenlight use the backup with their function? Uh, no. So the, the question was if, if Greenlight could be uh, a nefarious user uh, that, uh, that essentially causes you, your node to misbehave. And the thing is no, because in the database, in Core Lightning itself, we never say the commitment uh, signatures. Uh, we only, uh, if, if the channel is between the two of us, we only store yours, because yours we can't uh, reconstruct on, on the fly. Ours we can. We don't. Uh, we uh, don't sign it because, well, if somebody gets a copy of our backup, they could actually pretend they're us and cause us to get penalized. So yeah, that that's something that we built in very early on in in Uh But it means that you theoretically can do that. You can do a server side software update and store the signatures. Nothing prevents you from doing that. Uh, no, uh, because the signer has to be asked for the signature. We only give that out if we never see a future update for that. No, no, no. I, I mean that, uh, for instance, I have a commitment transaction, it is signed, then there is an update, and there is a new commitment transaction, it is signed. Nothing prevents you from keeping the previous signature. No, 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 no. You, you don't get your own signature. So what, what we do if we revoke, right? I give you signature for your commitment transaction. Yeah. You give me a signature for my commitment transaction. By mine, you mean the remote node, not the... Uh, the one you would be publishing and the one that I would yeah. be publishing. Notice that these are different. Yeah. So the signature I just gave you does not apply to my own commitment transaction. Oh, right. And so by essentially yeah. deferring the signature creation, this node never learns it until we actually want to use it. And one of, the, one of the policies in the signer is we never sign any updates after having given out a commitment signature. So this, we, we can actually enforce this on the signer side itself and it works out. Right, and the second question, uh, still the solution is trusted on backups so that you are not losing them. Uh, like if there was a nuclear war and the data center was destroyed. Uh, so yes, um, well, uh, I, I hope our database doesn't explode. It's a multi-regional database that is synchronously replicated. But yes, I, I agree. We could accidentally press a delete button. And uh, do you provide export? Like if I'd like to keep backup somewhere else as well? So uh, we, we do provide, as I, as I mentioned, one of the core goals for us is to eventually offboard you into, into your own infrastructure. And one of the features that we have is an export feature. Um, so instead of you having to essentially tear down your entire node, create a new node, maybe with a different software, and now you have to reconnect 15 wallets, what we give you is uh, you, this, this gRPC interface has a simple export function that marks your node as, uh, as exported in our database, kills it if it's still running, creates a backup of, of the database, encrypts it with your public key, puts it on, uh, onto Google Cloud Storage and returns a link to you. And now you can, uh, you can essentially go grab that copy, decrypt it, load it into Postgres, and have the same identical nodes with all of your channels, all still working, the same interfaces. And we do provide a couple of additional features, such as we do have a reverse proxy 
uh, that has, if your if your node is called ABC123, uh, you will have a URL abc123.gl.blockstream.com. And whenever you contact that, you will reach your node, independently of whether you exported it or whether it's still running with us. Um, we do that using a reverse proxy followed by reverse tunnel to get to you, uh, to your self-hosted infrastructure, wherever that might be. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is we also replace a couple of, uh, of, of other subdemons, such as the gossip uh, simply because you know it being offline for long times and you wanting to make use of it soon after it started, you can't just start up open connections and sort of have the gossip trickle in. We maintain a view of the network and we, uh, we, we uh, essentially stream that down to, you, uh, to your node in a couple of seconds. Is that like a, tr a trampoline node, or it's uh... no, no? You're you're still doing uh, local decisions, but the view of the network that you're using to create those local decisions is is something that we manage twenty four seven for you, and we give you a sketch of that such that you can you don't have to be online twenty four seven to get that information in the first place. So we essentially provide you with with a street map of the network as soon as you touch ground. Could uh, degenerate to a trampoline node in the degenerate scenario, which I don't think anyone can do. Uh, it could, yes, and th that that's a good point. That there's all there's always trade-offs here, of course, and the big one that most of you will probably have guessed is that we, as operators of the Lightning node, we actually have visibility into what is happening on that node. Now, that's on the one side, it's it's a privacy issue, right? We are we are essentially seeing what payments are going through. Uh, there are ways for us to reduce that. Trampoline being one of them, uh, essentially this node sends one HTLC to, a, to, a, to an external node and that node is now in charge of finding a route to the destination and driving that payment through. The other alternative is what I like to call oblivious send. Uh, we can actually sync the gossip over this connection too and the RPC in, in, in Core Lightning has a function called send onion. So you can provide it with a readily uh, encrypted uh, description of where to go, such that, uh, such that the node itself doesn't actually learn where payment is going. And that prospect is really exciting to me. Um, we'll, we'll see how it works out. Uh, of course, there's always a trade-off between in, in, in latency here. If, it's a trampoline node somewhere over here driving the payment. They are probably well connected, and their latency to the Lightning network is trivial. Uh, if Lightning D is driving this uh, the the payment, we are having to update our commitment transaction. So we produce some traffic on this uh, on this link, and depending uh, depending on latency, that might add up over time. Um, but messages are occasionally small. Uh, if we use oblivious send and drive the entire payment here, we are sending full onions over this uh, this connection, and those are kind of big. They're they're 1.3 kilobytes uh, each, and when you do a payment for 60, 70 uh, uh, of of these, that bandwidth can add up. So trade offs as always. Yeah. So basically, basically, you're saying that the router D can be also moved to the client site. Mm -hmm. And then the only thing that the, this, the only two things that the green light server will do is first maintain the network topology, which will be shared across all instances. And the second is to process and orchestrate processing of the router per payments coming from the external network, exactly. which doesn't involve router daemon, mm -hmm. but it does involve H H H HSMD daemon. So basically, you don't need even the whole lightning D there. Uh, oh, you, you uh, still need channel <laughs> demon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the majority of, of the of the lighting logic is implemented there. So, if we want to send an HLC, yeah, we yeah, better yeah. have the ability of doing so. But you're right. Lightning is pretty stripped down at the moment. Uh, most of the functionality that we provide as part of Pro Lighting is actually implemented in plugins as well. So we have a hierarchy of RPC methods that get more fine grained control to you as you as you sort of need more control. Uh, Sorry, was there one more question? I think not, perfect. Um, 
So no splitting of funds. If you bundle your node with, uh, with uh, the application, uh, you will need a node for each application, which also means that if you just want to try out a new application, suddenly you have to decide where to take those funds from. And for most users that will, oh, I really like that chat app, but I want to try that new wallet. Let me tear down the chat app, move funds, and start a new node for, for the wallet. Whereas if, if, you, uh, if you have this remote node uh, set up, all you need to do is you need to point the application to it and the funds are all there. Try out a new app. Well, it's as easy as downloading it from the app store and scanning a QR code as it. Um, we have, as I mentioned, the uh, upgrade path from us being the host to you being self-hosted. You in this case, end users again. Um, and uh, that is sort of a graduation ceremony at the end of your journey towards becoming a full, fully fledged uh, Bitcoiner. Um, you can have many front ends and signers. Uh, as long as one of them is, is active, you're, you're good to go. So I, I see, uh, uh, I can see setups that uh, where uh, essentially one uh, member of a family is a bit of a techie and he wants to set up a Raspberry Pi and he has a signer for his friend and family, and they uh, they run on, on a single on a single Raspberry Pi. You can run a couple of hundreds of signers. Uh, so you have to be really selective about who are, is really your friend and who isn't, because there's only a couple of hundreds possible. Um, I think that's most of it for the end users. I guess you're more interested in this one. Um, so I'm guessing most of us here are developers. Um, and my frustration was always, it's bloody hard to write a, an application for Lightning. Uh, I happen to be okay with the Lightning uh, protocol. I am absolutely the worst when it comes to UX and UI. And having to know both of them is kind of limiting, right? Um, so what we can do is green light essentially means that we split the, these concerns among ourselves, right? I know my way around the Lightning Network spe specification, and you might have an awesome idea that, that you want to realize, and you might have the chops of, uh, of making a beautiful looking application that I couldn't, I couldn't even dream of. So now, what, uh, uh, what, what we want to do here is we want to give you a simple, simple RPC that you can just use as if it were Stripe. Right? Um, we, uh, we, want to, uh, we want to enable you to uh, have even very, uh, very complex setups, right? Maybe you're, uh, you're a shop and you have a point of sale. You want to allow them to create an invoice. Uh, you have a back office that may send and receive payments. Uh, and then you have an accountant that needs to keep an audit trail of what, uh, what happens with your funds. All of this is essentially um, an, uh, an RPC call away right now. And even if you're just interested in setting up a small infrastructure, you have, you're participating in a hackathon, how much of your time is going into the actual setup, or probably you're going to Voltage and just enter your credit card because that's the easiest way to get started. Uh, with this, we we want to be, uh, we want to hand out notes to to hackathon participants and people who are experimenting with uh, with new and novel designs, and enable you to essentially. After a minute, be done setting up the infrastructure and actually get cracking with, with, with your actual application. Uh, we have bindings for a couple of languages. Uh, Python and JavaScript are uh, uh, the, the ones that I happen to sort of recognize the shape of. I tried C sharp, failed miserably. So if you have somebody who knows C sharp, please let me know. Yes. Uh, uh, so if, if you want, uh, want to have access to this, we are going to open source the, uh, the client side of all of this pretty soon and including the uh, GL plugin. Um, so 
we want you to, to, to enable you to actually recreate the same node you had on Greenlight on your own infrastructure. Um, and that's like 75% of the entire system, to be honest. Um, so that's going to be open source soon. If in the meantime you want access, just, just hit me up and I'll add you to the GitHub repository and we can start playing from there. Uh, that repository has all of the information. And of course, by us allowing you to replicate the, uh, the green light environment on your own node, it also means that application developers do not have to care about, am I talking to a self-hosted node? How do I reach it? Do I have to talk a uh, Lightning Network Connect? Do I have to open a port on the user's uh, uh, VLAN, uh, firewall or anything? No, it's, we, we will take care of all of that. It's 75% done already. Uh, we should we should be good to go. Uh, we should be good with the uh, with the offboarding process pretty soon. Um, yeah. So that's that part. Now I have a demo. Unless you have questions, and save me from the demo gods. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But it's better than uh, than uh, not uh, than than paying a uh, the, the core lightning team out of their generosity. Uh, so this at least has a path to a monetization. Um, my goal here is to to eventually have it pay for itself and not make a huge win. Don't tell that to our VCs though. Um, I, I see the bigger opportunity for us to essentially take this technology, uh, essentially having grown the pie by giving an onboarding uh, uh, method for, for new Bitcoiners. Having grown the pie is when we can turn around and actually create enterprise applications. Uh, because we do, have, we do have quite a bit of, uh, of additional ideas on how we could make these nodes highly available uh, how we could uh, how we could integrate them into uh, into business workflows. Um, so the separate signer having a multi signer setup is is very interesting and stuff like that. So um, yeah, this I I don't know. We'll see. Um, oh, yeah. One question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, maybe I ask. Um, I think the biggest challenge to onboard user into this model, like they have their own node, is, is not necessarily a technical challenge. It's like economic challenge of managing channel and mm -hmm. inbound liquidity and outbound liquidity. Uh, do you have any idea on that or input? So for, for outbound liquidity, it's pretty trivial. Either you have Bitcoin or you don't. If you have Bitcoin, you open a channel. Full stop. Um, and of course, uh, not, not being a UI expert, I can't tell you how to communicate that to users. Uh, but the gist of it is this, right? Either you have Bitcoins and can open a channel and start sending, or you don't have Bitcoins and you're lost. Uh, for incoming payments, however, we are working with LSPs uh, very closely with Breeze. Uh, so, so Breeze has, uh, has an excellent just-in-time LSP design that we were able to realize uh, in, in Core Lightning. Um, and that essentially allows us to open uh, open a channel in, in a couple of seconds. Don't want to share too much because the next presentation, the next workshop is Breeze talking, uh, talking about all of the cool features they build on top of this and more. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, but there are solutions for this. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, chain sync? Because some, sometimes the signer uh, needs to know about the state of the chain in order yeah. to decide whether he needs to sign something. How, how would you see that ideally? Uh, so, so what we do is uh, we internally don't use our C code anymore for the signer itself. We use a project called Validating Lightning Signer. And they have a, a, a set of, uh, of potential data sources they can tap into for exactly this kind of, uh, of attack where the, the node is omitting some information from the signer. So at that point, we would essentially rely on the signer going out and, 
and, and fetching that information themselves and sort of cross-checking that, oh, yeah, the, the node isn't omitting anything. From us. Hi. Uh, so my question would be, oh, yeah. um, how do you compare this product against uh, LDK? Mm -hmm. As in, what would be the target audience of end users and what would be the benefits or drawbacks of, of this product against, against LDK? So uh, LDK is a library, this is a service, uh, if I have to put it bluntly. Um, as far as I know, LDK have no intention of offering a service uh, for non-custodially hosted nodes. Um, and I totally understand why it's hard. Um, but uh, what's, what's also hard is the, the required knowledge that you have to have for LDK. Uh, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, the, with their LDK node project, which sort of puts everything into, uh, into an example configuration. Um, but the amount of knowledge, the, the deep knowledge about the Lightning uh, specification that you have to have to pick some of these parameters correctly is scary. Um, yeah. Is it, I also, well, my main point would be that to make an app such as Breeze for, for the end user in combination with Greenlight, you would still need such knowledge because you would be the LSP and to be the LSP, you would yeah. need some deeper knowledge as well. So the, the, the other issue is that uh, one, thing is, uh, one thing is the node itself. You also need to have the hardware to run it. Uh, so of course you could use LDK to spin up something that looks and feels very much like this, uh, but you actually need to have somebody who does it. Uh, so what, mo what the vast majority of LDK users will end up doing is bundling a node into their application because it's simple. But that brings with itself all of the downsides of now having a one-to-one -one relationship between app and node. Like, well, now you have to manage like three nodes just because you have three apps. Now you have to split your funds across the three nodes. Now you have to, uh, to manage channels for three nodes. So to me, it, it, it very much still puts a lot of work onto the app developer to automate a node that is running locally. Whereas here we can, uh, with this kind of setup, we can split the, uh, the um... exactly. Um, <laughs> we, we can split responsibility. So uh, somebody can do, uh, can, can create a channel management application that does nothing else than sort of collect statistics and finds the best possible channel partner for you. And that's the only aspect they have to care about. Whereas somebody who builds a chat application can concentrate on that use case. So here we are not competing against each other because we all need to build the same functionality and copy paste it from app to app. But really we can sort of combine multiple apps, multiple logic and pick and choose, first of all, what kind of logic we want in our node to run. So that, that, is, that is a general uh, advantage of this remote node setup. Um, but uh, this is the closest that, that I've seen anybody come to actually running this stuff. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of LDK too. So I definitely follow the, those developments closely too. Yeah, we have a long time, it's remaining. Oh yeah, so uh, shall I? Let's see if I can, is that my demo tab? Yes. Um, so what, what we have here is essentially, I have created a new directory. Um, that's the wrong tab, sorry. Uh, so you can see I have given this uh, demo about 30 times because the, the thing is called, <laughs> okay, um, so uh, what I have here is, is an empty directory, essentially. Uh, what I'm going to do now is create a key pair for us to use uh, using uh, GLCLI, which is just a tiny, tiny Python uh, command line uh, tool, which essentially does just take my command line arguments, bundle it into a gRPC command, and send it off. 
not not much logic going on there. Um, if I, uh, if for example, I just run a GLCLI scheduler ping, we will see that, oh, this doesn't work, but the side effect that I wanted is, is here. So we have, we have an HSM secret file. Uh, so I just needed to run any command to generate that. Uh, sorry for that uh, error message there. Uh, if you uh, if you look into the uh, into the uh, HSM secret, you will see it's just 32 bytes of random data, probably generated from a seed phrase. Um, what we can do now is we essentially go this to Um What I will do is I will say, uh, "Hey scheduler, register for network testnet." Uh, I like to use testnet for this, and it's the T30, not the T30. What happens here is um, I've essentially just contacted the uh, the uh, scheduler, which is managing where nodes run and which nodes exist, and coordinates all of this. Think of it very much like the API server on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, what we've gotten here is a TLS certificate and a private key. Uh, which essentially represent our identity, right? Whenever we talk to Greenlight, we are now going to be identified as that user through that, uh, that uh, certificate. And we see that I just stored it, uh, stored them here on this uh, CA, uh, CA device key and device cert. These are really just TLS certificates. If you've ever handled TLS certificates, they're just that. Um, so now comes the interesting part, and uh, we can say scheduler ping again, and we will see that ooh, it's not currently running. Let's, let's make it running, schedule. And we see that it is indeed running on one of our machines somewhere in, this is San Francisco, hence why it's really long latency. Sorry about that. Um, but we see that we can essentially contact our node at this address. So let's do so. Um, let's call get info. Um, we see that it's called opnet. It's running version 22.11, GL1. You can tell more about GL1, what that means. Uh, but it's just a correlating node, like any other. Um, now we can, for example, uh, sorry. We're exposed to. Uh, let's take, for example, this one. Um, what we can do now is connect, and I'll add a small little detail here that I will explain in a second. So um, it's not happening. Why is that? because we currently don't have any sign or fetch. Um, but as soon as we, uh, as we say, hey, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll open up the logs as well, just because it's funny. Um, so we can stream the logs in real time from the node, and we can start the, the signer in the lower, uh, lower right-hand side, and we will see that we start getting requests. One thing that, uh, that we can see is that there is an ECDH exchange. So when contacting a, a, another node, we actually need to prove to them, hey, we are who we say we are. Hence the access to the signer, hence why it didn't work uh, before. You'll also notice in the meantime, it timed out. Uh, so these, these connections have about a 10 second timeout, uh, which is annoying. But if I repeat that command, you will see both uh, tabs on, on the right hand side, the log and the HSM make progress, signing off, and it should in the end uh, end up with a successful connection. So, yeah, we made contact with that node and we are now connected. So, it very much looks like a sea lightning node. Uh, for my next trick, um, since I have Five more minutes. I'll just repeat the same thing again. Uh, 
Notice that these, uh, the, the signer is currently not even connected. The signer is currently waiting at the scheduler for its node to be scheduled. And at that point, sorry, that point, <laughs> at, at that point, it will uh, then uh, actually reconnect from the scheduler to the node process uh, process requests and detach and reattach in the waiting position at the scheduler for a future time. Um, so now if I, uh, if I were to open up the logs on, on the right hand side, uh, we will see that it's processing some blocks. It, uh, it has a connection being reestablished and we can see on the left hand side that we can list Peers, and we will see a couple. So these are all without channels, but you will see that there is one that has a channel up here. Now for the party trick that works sometimes and makes me really nervous. Um, we request a payment from some out. <coughs> this is htlc.me, not me. Uh, so all I wanted was an invoice that I could pay, but okay. Is it? Uh, no, it's actually the, the service not reacting. <sighs> Cannot post root? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, that's not a good question. Ah, let's see. That's good. Good information. Um, no, it actually works now. So we have an invoice. That was the entire goal of this little detour. Uh, but what we can do now is we can say pay the invoice. And let me see if I can have them side by side so we can at least see something happening. Some way for me to make the map. Let's, let's just let's just press enter. Um, I'll also add time just for the fun of it. Um, so now we see all three tabs have a bit of motion. Uh, we see the top one signing up on stuff, the bottom one showing logs, the right hand side getting green, and the left hand side now showing us we actually sent ten millisatoshis, uh, ten satoshis to that service uh, in seven point four eight seconds. Uh, most of that is connection latency. And that's already the entire party trick. Um, <laughs> and the, the library should be relatively easy to. Uh, the library itself is very easy. So um, I like to. Follow Python. Um, so pip install to get the library. Uh, we now create a node identity. We go through, so we generate a random 32-byte uh, uh, secret. We then go through BIP39, uh, mm. all of this is external to Greenlight. All we care about is we have 32 bytes of randomness. We then create a TLS configuration. Uh, I don't know why that doesn't have any code in it, but let's move on, move on to registering. Registering really just means, hey, we have some 32-byte secret on disk. Uh, I create a signer using that 32 bytes. I get my node ID, and now I'm setting up the connection to the scheduler, and I call one method. That's the entire trick here. Uh, starting is just as easy. You take the node ID, the network, the TLS configuration, and you tell the scheduler, hey, where's my node? And you can start talking to it. This node object that, 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 that you get back here is, uh, is essentially a gRPC stub with some added magic. 
So anything you can call on for liking, you can call on that stub and it will be performed on your node in the cloud, just as if you were typing it into the uh, server shell itself. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the shortish demo. Uh, I hope it was underwhelming as, uh, uh, as promised. Um, but yeah, maybe one last question. I think I have one minute. Thanks. Can, can you tell I'm enjoying the questions? <laughs> so several people smarter than myself made some attempts to poke holes, you know, in, in, in green light and your mm -hmm. design and trade-offs. And, and, you, and you also po uh, pose some trade-offs as far as comparing it to LDK and the trade-offs of having to support multiple devices and that kind of thing. So that would be like a, an advantage in your, in your green light situation. I don't think anybody here is more qualified than you to tell us what you think the actual like biggest weaknesses are of this design, like what is the biggest trade-off from choosing this? What is the what would you say is the worst part of this? Worst part for me? Oh, that's that's quite easy. Uh, for me, I still have too much information. I don't want that information. Uh, there is also some of uh, some information that I that uh, that I, I don't want to be able to see a user's activity. I don't want to see where their payments are going from. Uh, currently, we, um, we essentially firewall us off by not putting a, an association between user and the node they're running. So we don't have an email. You're, you're for a key pair for us. But, or, or the bot or payment? Uh, no, it's all clear yet. Uh, but the nodes are ours. So that those are our IP addresses. What, what we see is your IP on the gRPC, uh, which could go through a number of boxes. Uh, so that's an option. I can promise you that, that, I'm, that I'm not logging it, but of course, that's, you have to trust me on that. And it's definitely, I want to have a way of proving to you that I don't have that information, uh, including invoices, payments, and all of that. Yeah, I guess even if I did trust you, it still puts you in a position of centralization where mm -hmm. you could be manipulated. And, and I would define this ultimately as Greenlight is still a permissioned solution to some degree. And so it could be cut, the service could be cut off, data could be deleted, data could be slurped, yeah. et cetera. So uh, one thing that, that I hope to address that partially of us disappearing from one day to the next is that uh, you could essentially build an appliance that streams database backups in real time through the backup uh, interface to your device, such that if we were to disappear from today to tomorrow, uh, then uh, then you would at least have the latest state and could reconstruct uh, reconstruct it. Well, that's sharing information with more parties, right? Now you and I have the database. It doesn't make remove it from me, and I want to remove as much information from that database that I'm managing on your behalf, such that I don't have to learn anything about you. I think of it as a, uh, from, from GDPR perspective as well, right? If, if you as a user approach me, you can ask me to delete any data that I have with you and I'm forced to do so. If I don't store that data, I can, I can just comply with your GDPR request without any issues, right? So this this is this is very much the the trade off here. Uh, you share some information with us um, that I'm not interested in, but for the sake of operating it, we sadly have to maintain. There is one upside though, um, and that is why this this entire project is interesting for for Lightning open source users as well, namely that by operating uh, the largest cluster of core Lightning nodes in existence. It gives us a pretty good view of what works and what doesn't uh, to inform our development of core lightning open source. And that is something that, that I personally notice as well. I have my own core lightning node. Is it representative of what users do and the experience they get? Hell no. But I want to be able to be, uh, to in a, be in a position to tailor it, to experiment to improve the performance of core lightning. And 
some visibility into the performance aspects of uh, of a node are definitely something that is interesting from our point of view. So it's it's a balance that we have to figure out. I don't think we can make it as uh, annoying as I'd like it to be, but uh, yeah, uh, we we definitely want to go down that road and see where it really goes, how far we can go. Awesome. Um, I think I'm five minutes over. Uh, thank you all. So, oh, I actually have a slide for this. And here I am saying that I'm not prepared. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we'll see you in 30 minutes for the last uh, workshop of the day. And it's going to be a uh, breeze SDK.